Okay, I'd like to call this, there we go. I'd like to call, uh, Ms. Huerta, would you please call the roll? Okay, I'll start with the city council members. Mayor Paulette Guajardo. President. Council members Roland Barrera. Here. Sylvia Campos. Here. Gil Hernandez. Here. Michael Hunter. Here. Jim Klein. Here. Mike Pesley. Here. Everett Roy. Here. Dan Suckley. Here. City, um, <coughs> Assistant City Manager Steve Vieira. Here. City Attorney Miles Risley. Here. Okay, Mayor and Council, a quorum of the Council and the required Charter Officers are present to conduct the meeting. Great. Thank you, Rebecca. Okay, so uh, next I'll call, Mayor, I have to call the Planning Commission and then oh. the SEAC. Just roll. Just okay, yes, I'm bear sorry. Bear with me for a second. Yes, go right ahead. So for Planning Commission, Chairman Michael Miller, <coughs> Vice Chair Michael York is absent. <coughs> Michael Budd. <coughs> Cynthia Salazar Garza. <coughs> Justin Hedrick. <coughs> Billy Lerma. <coughs> Brian Mandel <coughs> is absent. <coughs> Javid Motagi. And Mike Munoz? Here. Okay. Okay, we have a quorum of the planning commissioners. Finally, we have the Capital Improvement Advisory Committee. Chairman Moses Mustagashi? Here. Vice Chair Coretta Graham? Is absent. Tricia Atkin? Absent. Bart Brazelton? Here. Rudy Garza? Absent. Haley Gonzalez? Absent. Jonathan Gonzalez? Absent. Alex Harris? Absent. J.J. Hart. Here. Eli McKay. Here. Ramiro Munoz. Here. Melody Nixon Bice is absent. Chad Skrbarczyk. Here. Trey Summers. Absent. And Velda Thames. Here. Okay, we do have a quorum present <coughs> to conduct the meeting. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Rebecca. So thank you all for. Thank you all for better for joining today. We appreciate it. Uh, this is the joint workshop of the City Council, the Planning Commission, and Capital Improvements Advisory Committee. Uh, and it's a work session. So I don't think we each have our individual microphones, but if you'd like to speak, if you'll just raise your hand and I'll keep an eye out for anybody that, that would like to make comment or have a question, and then we'll call upon you. With many of us being here, that'll be a little bit um, important in terms of uh, being efficient during this meeting. So with that, I will um, hand it over to Al Raymond. Thank you, Mayor, and welcome uh, uh, Council, uh, Planning Commissioners, and SEAC uh, members uh, to this workshop. Uh, as the Mayor said, it's the City Council, Planning Commission, and SEAC workshop on SEAC impact fee recommendations. Before yeah, Al, can you? Do exactly that, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just bring it in a little closer so okay, we can hear great. you a little better. Can you hear me now? Much better. Great, okay. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to uh, acknowledge Mayor and Council. Uh, I understand there could be meeting fatigue because you had a long day on Monday and an even longer day on Tuesday. So if you'll bear with me, uh, this is only about 27 slides. Uh, you can certainly ask questions, but if you hold, we can get to the meat of really the discussion of impact fees. And you, you have the SEAC members here that can answer why, what was our thought process, those kinds of things. So uh, I don't think we'll be here till 4 o'clock. So if you just uh, bear with me. Uh, we will get started with that. Uh, first, I'd like to mention, I know that I'm uh, always kind of upfront with, um, with this project, but this is really a, a multi-city effort, right? City department effort. And I'd like to recognize those in the room, um, Corpus Christi Water, you know, led by Drew and uh, Nick is here and, and, and uh, West who's not here, but they've been primary contacts on this project from the very beginning, three years ago. I'd like to recognize uh, Corpus Christi Public Works, uh, that's Ernie's department led by uh, Renee and Gabriel. Uh, they've been very instrumental in getting us to where we are. I'd like to recognize Dan McGinn, Corpus Christi's planning department. Uh, Dan McGinn and his team has contributed as well, and, and collectively we have worked with the SEAC members to get to where we are today. I'd also like to recognize for three years, of course, the consultant that ha has helped guide us and uh, provided their uh, professional expertise to get us to this point as well. That's Pape Dawson, Kara, and her team, uh, Jake. Justin, uh, Angie, um, and Kim, yes. 
So uh, it's been a collaborative effort, uh, and I, I, I and we and that effort has led us to where we are today. So with that, uh, I'll get kind of underway. <coughs> there you go. What is an impact fee? Because that that's what we'll be discussing for most of the day. And just cutting to the chase, the, the last bullet basically says it's a one-time fee. Uh, uh, paid uh, one-time uh, payment levied on new or expanding development for some share of its capital cost being placed on the utility services or on roadway system. That's kind of the Reedish Digest version of, hey, what's an impact fee and how is it utilized? We, we can certainly talk about that more when we get to the discussion overall, but that really is the nutshell of, 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 of why we're here today. This is the Capital Improvement Advisory Committee, the SEAC Committee. Uh, many of these members have, this was established, uh, council established this committee in uh, August of 21. And many of these members have been with us for over three years, right? Uh, a lot of heavy lifting, a lot of drinking from the fire hydrant, but the group uh, has been very diligent and very committed to, to wanting to, to you know, see Corpus Christi uh, develop and grow in in a in a in a organized manner. So, uh, yeah, I, I like to thank you for your commitment. Those of you who've been with us for a while, and those of you who just hung in there because we had a lot of meetings beyond kind of these meetings, where it was workshop meetings, SEAC meetings, offline meetings, just to get an understanding of of what we're dealing with, right? And that group led to these uh, recommendations, right? Items one, two, three are recommendations that went forward to City Council in, in the month of January of this year. Future land use assumptions updated, uh, the master plans and the associated capital improvement projects with those master plans. Uh, SEAG recommended to move that forward to Council and Council did approve that, thank you very much, in January of 2024. The next thing that is slated to come before Council is uh, CX's recommendation on impact fees for the city of Corpus Christi. That is slated to come before council in uh, July of this year. Impact fee calculation process. This is very high level, right? And those of you who I, I know who want to get into the details, we can do that at the discussion point because we have the experts here, uh, even on the city side and, of course, on the uh, consultant side. But in general, right, uh, the impact fee calculation process is to define an impact fee service area, which, we, which we've done, or SEAC has helped do that, establish utility demands, develop a 10-year uh, CIP. Uh, the master plans that were approved really for, were, were for a 10-year period, 2023 to 2033. Yeah. Uh, determine portions of the projects uh, attributed to, to future growth which we've done, calculate the weighted cost uh, per service unit, and we'll talk about what exactly is a service unit on the next slide. Uh, apply rate credit, 50% to determine maximum allowable fee. And, and we're gonna say that kind of several times a day. And adopt and assess the maximum allowable fee or uh, a fee below the maximum allowable. So in short, uh, uh, service unit standardizations, and the first bullet really says it all. The service unit uh, is defined as a typical single family residential, which we use the term ERU, which is equivalent residential uh, dwelling unit, equivalent residential unit. Uh, the impact fees are based on uh, ERU, right? And you may say, well, what, what about commercial developments? And the, the third bullet kind of says, hey, there's, we have to convert ERUs to other land uses, right? And we do that through water meter sizing, right? So the chart on the right-hand side of the, the uh, slide uh, has the meter size there, which, you know, let's take the first one, which is five-eighths or really more like three-quarters. Uh, that's a residential unit. Uh, that's a equivalent residential unit. That's uh, one equivalent residential unit for that size meter. And as you go down for larger meters, you have the, the equivalency of the ERUs on the far right-hand side. And that's how you determine the water uh, impact fee for commercial development and the wastewater impact fee for commercial development. Policies and procedures, uh, policy and procedure development. Um, 
implementation of this system requires a, a, a lot of things that we haven't done before. We, the city, collectively haven't done before. So it's going to require it's going to require a lot of thought, a lot of forward thinking, a lot of processes in place, checks and balances, and those kinds of things. So we, we, the city, has to work with you know the SEAC members to develop draft policies and procedures for how we would implement impact fees should council uh, uh, adopt impact fees. Key policies will be presented to council prior to the uh, prior to the July uh, decision, right? Because there are, there have been commentaries like, hey, we're going to vote on this, and we don't even know what the policies are. Well, we're going to start working, and I think. Uh, the chair of SEAC has said, hey, he wants to establish a subcommittee uh, tomorrow to begin to work with the uh, city staff and the consultant to develop the policies that we need to, to, to better organize and implement this, 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 this program. This is, uh, this is kind of a brief of the policies that we'll think we need. And this is just a, kind of the very high level, hey, we need to do this, we need to do that. But there are probably a lot of policies that we haven't even thought about that we'll need to do prior to implementing impact fees should council uh, pass impact fees. But just in general, uh, one of the things I wanted to point to that uh, many people have pointed to, like the redevelopment requirements uh, here, uh, right there, right? The redevelopment requirements and guidelines, because that's important. Because uh, when we start looking at the impact fees proposed, uh, many of the air, many of our utilities, water, wastewater, and stormwater, have one service area. So uh, many people felt like, "Gosh, if we go to one service area, how are you going to? How, how will we know we want this area? We want to incentivize growth in this area, push growth to this area of the city, and we're going to do that through redevelopment policies or infill development, if you will. Uh, application of credits, right uh, next to it. That's that's a new thing for the city, right? Because uh, if you put the line in yourself, uh, the developer or the builder will get credits. And uh, since it's one service area from Cal Island to the island, he, he'll be able to use those credits across the city, right? So we need to understand the, the, you know, what that means and how it can be utilized. Of course, trust fund projects uh, initiated prior to impact fee implementation. That's huge here, obviously, because that's how we uh, extend the new infrastructure today for water and wastewater. So we've got to, and we've been working with, uh, with Peter and, and, and the fifth floor to kind of determine, hey, what's the logical transition from trust funds if impact fees are indeed, sorry, if impact fees are indeed adopted by the city. Um, potential fee waiver considerations, that's kind of a part of the redevelopment process in terms of in certain areas of the town, we may consider, we being council, may consider waiving fees just so we can incentivize development in some areas, uh, certain areas around town where where development has lagged and we, we think there's better plan for the future in those areas. And the city procedure for implementation, that's huge because how, how do we jump off? How do we start? Uh, how do we monitor it to make sure it's, it's going correctly, uh, it's, it's being handled fair, if there are little tweaks that need to be made. All those things are part of the policies that we'll need to develop. And, and since we're bringing this to you, since uh, the impact fees will be before council in July, which means we'll probably bring a briefing to council in the month of June on policies that we think we need to adopt uh, to support the impact fees should you adopt them. Master plan projects related to growth. So in, in a nutshell, right, in a nutshell, um, the far left-hand column are, are the total amount of the CIP projects associated with the master plans that were approved by council in January. Why is this important? Because uh, overall it shows, uh, if, if you take the, the column second to the last column, second to the right, I guess, uh, which talks about estimated costs for projects associated with growth in the next 10 years, right? That's how much money of the overall impact fee that are really attributed to, to growth. However, that only works if growth happens. If growth doesn't happen, it, uh, you got a project that kind of stays on the shelf unless the city chooses to implement it uh, because, hey, look, uh, you know, these things are happening. This is something we might want to consider, right? And so the percentages overall for growth seem high on the, on the far right-hand side, but it only happens if growth happens, right? And as you know, we adopted a, well, I say adopted, we, SEAC uh, settled on a growth rate of 
0.3%. Shortly after that, the MPO says, no, 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 Corpus Christi is a little less than 1%. But be that as it may, less than 1%, 1% or 1.3%, it really means we are you know, at a snail's pace, right? So uh, the chances are uh, that what, what uh, the consultant did is give, uh, gave us master plans with the ultimate build out, which goes beyond 10 years. But in the 10 year time period, the growth related to that 10 year time period that you see here may not occur, or I should say it this way, it only occurs if the city grows, right? It only occurs if. Thank you. Um, okay, the, the slide up is really very simple, right? And I want you to pay attention to the graphic on the left-hand side, which basically the consultant calculated, uh, based on the CIP numbers I showed you uh, on the previous slide, the consultant calculated uh, what would be the maximum fee to the maximum fee for charging impact fees to support that infrastructure should we have to extend it or, or build new infrastructure, whether it's water, wastewater, stormwater, uh, and roads are a little different. Um, so the 100% reflects the CIP rate for maximum, uh, the maximum fee that we can charge. The state requires us to cut that in half. So that's the 50% mark there, right? The state requires us to cut that in half. And the green area is what SEAC recommends can, can be assessed and what council can uh, recommend to be assessed. You can go anywhere from the 50% maximum allowable rate all the way down to, to zero, if you will. And of course, we're gonna talk about that in a little more detail here shortly. Stormwater. And I owe Councilman uh, Suckley an apology because he asked me for this, I don't know, a month ago. I'm <laughs> just now getting it to you, thank you. See, we do respond, we may be slow, but we do respond. Uh, but what he wanted is a comparison, right? Because he knew that SEAC recommended, had a recommendation, but he wanted to know, well, what's the city consultant's rec recommendation? And so I, I put that here for, for all of you because I thought, okay, yeah, that may be, that's a great transparency, right? So you can see uh, where we were and what we ultimately ended up with. So on the city side, the city consultant side, we recommended uh, $100 per ERU, right, for stormwater, and uh, $30.49 per thousand square feet of impervious cover for anything other than residential. So you're taking down, you're, you're doing a residential development and you, you have 50 lots, those lots will be multiplied by 100, and that'll be the stormwater impact fee. If it's a commercial lot, we would we recommend it finding out what the impervious cover is of that lot, multiplying that by thirty dollars and forty nine cents, and that would be the the stormwater impact fee for that lot. And as you see at the bottom there, we recommended adopting the the max rate of a hundred dollars per ERU, a hundred dollars per ERU, which is which is uh, the recommendation from the city and the consultant. SEAC looked at that, uh, assessed it, talked, communicated, corporate communicated, collaborated, and coordinated, and came up with a different recommendation. And a recommendation, uh, they have one service area as before, as recommended, but they assessed uh, $100 per residential lot, or ERU, if you will, and they waived the fee, the stormwater fee for commercial. They're recommending waiving the fee for stormwater fee for commercial development. Although they do recommend adopting stormwater at the maximum rate uh, suggested by the consultant, and that's what you see there at the bottom there. So what, what, what they're recommending is to adopt the 
dollars per uh, ERU for res for residential, and the thirty dollars and forty nine cents uh, per a square foot for a thousand square feet for impervious cover, but they're only recommending to assess the one hundred dollars for residential lots and zero for uh, waiving the fee for commercial development. And I'm sorry. Yes. Yes, sir. Sorry. Okay. Two two questions. Where do you, where do you, how did you arrive at the hundred dollar fee? Y'all just picked that out of the air, or was there some basis, mathematical? It was calculations. Uh, it, it was it was uh, out of this out of these numbers, which we would will we can certainly get into uh, it once I get through the slides. Uh, come on, come on. sure, go. Well, sure, answer that. Councilman, it is based on uh, square footage of impervious cover for a typical residential lot. And so at that $30.59 a square foot, it equated to about $100 a square foot. It was actually, I think the original CAC was $100.54. And we thought $0.54 cents was so close, just round to $100. Okay. And then why are you exempt from the non-residential lot? Uh, and we can discuss that at the end, uh, Councilman. I just wanted to kind of get through this for you to kind of get your questions so that you can ask because uh, SIEC is here, so you can uh, you can kind of ask them what were their thought, what was their thought process on doing exactly what your your question was. Okay, I'm not sure what the answer was, but uh, whatever. Yes, sir. Uh, one quick. Is this uh, I, I hope so. Yeah. It's, a, it's the same thing. Uh, we, uh, single family residents are uh, equivalent residential unit. But why the change in nomenclature? It, it, we should have said consistent across. It means the same thing. Because, I mean, you have ERUs that are multifamily, and that's kind of pitfalling it to single family residential lots. True, but as I said earlier, um, at multifamily, we would count the units, uh, the apartments as uh, ERUs. But if you had a, a commercial site, it would be based on uh, water and wastewater would be based on the meter size. Stormwater, as I said, is exempt right now. Re the recommendation is to waive the stormwater fee for commercial sites. And that's what the councilman was saying. Hey, why is that? And we, we can certainly discuss that here in, in a bit. OK. I just the difference in nomenclature. Just kind of raised a red flag. Okay. Yeah, and it it, it means the same thing. We could have been consistent across the board. Uh, okay. Oh, oh that, that's a good point. Thank you. Uh, and and th this is just the the service area for stormwater, which is the entire uh, Oso watershed. That's the one service area where impact fees would be charged because that's growth related area of the city. There you go. Um, next is wastewater. Um, again, on the left hand side is the city consultant's recommendation, and we recommended uh, 600 for, for treatment. We recommended $656 for treatment, uh, $612 for infrastructure, uh, wastewater infrastructure, and that, that total is. Uh, $1,268 per ERU, or residential unit, if you will. Um, again, as I said, uh, the, that's for residential. The commercial uh, uh, impact fee will be based on meter size, as I showed you earlier. Uh, SEAC took that information, communicated, coordinated, collaborated, uh, discussed, and they, they uh, recommended the following uh, on the right-hand side. Again, one service area, as I said, but they recommended zero for treatment, uh, the $612 for infrastructure, and that's a total of $612 per ERU for residential. Uh, and as I said before, uh, commercial uh, development would be based on meter size. Uh, the ERUs times the 612 for commercial would give the would provide the commercial uh, impact fee. And, and all of this. Uh, 
Uh, again, uh, being um, trying to be respectful of your time, all of this will be discussed. You know, at the end, I just kind of want to get through this so we can get to the discussion part because I'm sure every, uh, there's a lot of like, well, why or whatever, which SEAC uh, is here and they can better answer the why question. All of this, uh, there are six, as you all know, there are six wastewater treatment areas in the city and SEAC. Uh, and the consultant recommended to, to make this one service area from Cal Allen to the island. And so that's just a, a, a picture of what that is. Water. Again, on the left-hand side is the city consultant recommendations. Uh, one service area again. Uh, and, this, and we had recommended uh, water source, uh, $261, uh, water treatment, $655, and we, and we have those calculations to say where do these numbers come from, and water system transmission, $950. Um, SEAC took that, communicated, coordinated, collaborated, and made the following recommendations. Again, they stay with one service area, but they recommended zero for water service, they recommended zero for water treatment, and they recommended the 950 for tra system transmission, so that uh, uh, water for a single family uh, single family lot uh, is nine, uh, the impact fee is 950 dollars. Again, for commercial, it's based on meter size uh, for the water impact fee. And uh, and again, even in wastewater, SEAC recommends adopting. At the maximum allowable rate, which is the 12, which is the 1866. However, uh, they want to assess at less than that, which is the 950, which we, which we obviously will discuss. And this, this is the picture of the entire city, the water uh, for the entire city from Cal Allen to the island, one service area. Well, yes. Again, it just seems like these numbers are totally arbitrary. We'll, we'll and uh, I know that we'll discuss that as soon as we're I'm done here. Okay. And shortly. Yes. Um, sorry, transportation. Transportation is a bit more challenging, as the uh, Councilman Pusley said. It's because it even seems more arbitrary because. State law requires us to, to, state law has a limit of what we can do in service areas with roadways or transportation. And that limit is about six, uh, six mile radiuses, right? So that, that, since we have a linear city, that creates about 21 service areas. So the roadway master plan uh, has 21 service areas, which we couldn't uh, make into one service area simply because this, the state law requires specific items on roadways, right? So with that being said, this is uh, the city's, this is the city consultant's recommendation on, on roadways. The 50%, and make sure I say this correctly, the 50%, uh, when I showed you on the chart before, this says, hey, here's the, the number we can play with, right? Uh, the recommendation from, for, the, for the consultant was to, to go uh, go to 90% on that and only charge the, the, the I'm sorry, great, reduce it by 90% of the 50% and charge the developer 10%, right? So when you see the uh, fee per vehicle miles on, on the column on the right-hand side, the fee per vehicle miles is the commercial rate and the fee per lot or ERU is the residential rate. That's in, uh, and there's a different fee in all of the service areas, and it's a different fee in all the service areas because in each service area, it required more or less work to, to more or less work to, uh, I don't wanna say be compliant, but to um, assist with growth or prepare for growth, right? So that's why there are so many fees in this, in this category. SEAC took this uh, through communication, coordination, collaboration, uh, I hope you like that, Moses. And they proposed um, this. Of the 50% that reduce it 90 95% of the 50%, which means that uh, the developer would pay 5%, a 5% cost of, of, the, of the fee in each service area, right? 
and the, the numbers are a little less, as you can see, for commercial and the same for residential. Uh, however, SEAC recommended assessing, you know, the, of the 5%, which is the maximum allowable rate according to SEAC, they're recommending assessing a zero fee for roadway infrastructure. Um, and of course, uh, that'll, that'll be discussed further as well. And then here's, the, here's a map of, of course, the 21 service areas all over the city. Hi there, and then here, here Al's handing over to me. What we've got here up on the screen is one of the questions that we've heard from many of you is what is the regulatory impact, you know, for example, on a residential home of assessing this impact fee? So this chart has a number of cities across Texas of what they do on a single family, and this is just a single family. So many of these cities have tables that outline different land uses, different criteria for the different fees. The most common assessed across Texas is water and wastewater. So that's what this table focuses on because not all cities have a roadway or a stormwater. So this gives the most consistency. And so looking at this, what you can see is Corpus is here with the red orange arrow at what it would be is 1562 per ERU which is equivalent to one single family. And then remember the stormwater was an additional $100 to that. But the water and wastewater combined is 1,562. Looking across some of the other cities in our area, you know, Portland is a recent one that has been talking. They actually created three service areas in theirs. One is their old town, which they set at zero. Then they created one they called tier one which was assessed at 50% of their maximum allowable, and that's kind of almost right there in the middle of the screen. And, and that one, it's really their existing developed areas, and then everything else for the city was tier two, which they set at 100% of their max. And that number is 8,541. So in comparison, this is kind of giving us a what does it look like for the regulatory. We wanted to take that a little further, and what does that mean as a percentage of cost of the home? I know that at least one of you multiples had kind of asked us, what does that mean? So based on February 2024 information from uh, the Economic Development Corporation, the Association of Realtors, 275000 is the median home price here in Corpus. So what that means for us, if you've got an average home price or a median of two seventy five. dollars um, and it's difficult to say what is that total cost because remember traffic had all these different ones. So you've got a table here that shows if we were assessing traffic, let's use four different examples with four very different numbers for the transportation one, what that looks like. But the actual recommendation coming forward today or for consideration, the $1,662 per residential home is about 0.64% of that average home price. And then the numbers are there for the others if transportation was included does as part include of it. Does that include transportation? Transportation is not, Councilman, the right-hand side because the committee recommended assessing transportation at zero. That is not in the right-hand side table. The left-hand numbers do include a transportation for the original recommendation we had of 10% of that maximum fee. And we picked four of the 21 areas versus listing 21 here, for example. Well, again, to me, it just seems like it's arbitrary. Are these um, comparative uh, fees, are these just looking at each individual city's water and wastewater alone? Correct. Okay. Mayor, question. Um, on the, um, you didn't give a comparative analysis in terms of what we're currently connect, collecting under the current system, and I believe it's only water and wastewater, and how that compares to what this is proposed. And what you have on this screen is different from what you had on the previous screen. 
You have 16. So yeah. right here, the 1562 is only water and wastewater because that gave us the ability to give a consistent comparison across all of these cities okay. here. And this So this is the added $100 of the adding the $100, correct. Okay. Correct. So currently we don't collect on stormwater. Correct. So we're going to collect on something we're not, we put all on the developer to begin with, right? So this is on top of what they have to put in? The developer is required, and you know, I can let Al and team jump in on the UDC, what's required, but they're required to build facilities for their development, their subdivision, their roadways, their connections. What these impact fees cover, and in particular in Oso, you know, there are large drainage systems that are needed, large trunk lines as we refer to them, that aren't within one individual project and that aren't being built by one individual developer. So these are contributing to the sizing of those, the capacity of those, and the cost of those because those will serve all that water coming from new development. Okay, so getting back to the original question, what is the, what, was, what are we currently collecting compared to what you're proposing? I, I think this is the answer you're looking for. Uh, the trust fund uh, requires the developer to pay, the trust fund for water and wastewater requires the developer to pay approximately a little over $1,000 per lot. So with, 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 our, uh, with the proposed 1662, uh, it's an additional of about $662, give or take. Yes, JJ. JJ, I can't hear JJ, you. the other one. No, that Bart, give Bart, that the one, one Bart on has. Bart. Yeah. Bart's work. <laughs> Mike has mentioned a couple times that he thinks the numbers are arbitrary. Can you just take two minutes to flow through the CIPs, what they represent, and then how they became impact fees? Sure, I was trying to get to a slide. The and... numbers are not arbitrary. The 50% is not arbitrary. What we adopt and assess after yeah. that is, yeah. but the CIP itself is not arbitrary, and the impact fees are not arbitrary. Apparently, this thing moves slower than I do. No, don't, don't slow down because of me. Well, no, I think it's important. No, it is important. Well. It is important. There we go. Let's hope it stays that I didn't click it 50 other times. Okay, so what this chart is trying to show is at the top, you see this label that says 100% CIP rate. So when you add up all of the projects in the capital plan, and the dollars associated with those, you then calculate what percentage of those were associated with growth. That is that maximum 100% number there on the top of that bar. What happens then, and the state statute recognizes master plans are fluid, they are estimations of growth, they are estimations of projects, that all of that will evolve along the way. So it gives a formula to say, you can't assess up there because that's too uncertain at the level of detail that's known. So one option is you can go through an elaborate assessment of how your rates are calculated, what's included in rates, what's not, or you can reduce that number by 50%. So when we talk about the maximum rate, and that's in the statute that just says, so you see how we hop down to this green box here? that says 50% CIP rate, that is per the statute says you have two options. You go through a complicated process and reduce it by an amount or you cut that number in half. And so what we did is we cut that number in half. That is the maximum number that the CAC could even consider recommending. So when you see notes further throughout here that says maximum adopted or maximum allowable, that is talking about that rate that calculated the costs of all the projects in the 10-year plan times the percentage associated with growth and cut it in half. So you go through project group by group, section by section. Okay, let me, let me ask another question here. 
Okay, so the way the trust funds work is that they paid the lot fees and whatever comes to $1,000 per lot, or you're referring to it as ERU, right? Uh, and then the, those same developers can access it to reimburse for infrastructure such as a lift station, you know, uh, wastewater lines, water lines uh, specifically. So what this looks like is that they would still have to, the developer would still have to build that infrastructure, pay for it, and then this would impact fee goes to how it impacts other um, infrastructure beyond what they're building for themselves. Is that correct? Well, the developer is going to look at each individual project and say, I need to build this water line. And that water line is on the master plan at um, a size, one size larger than I think I need for my project. So the city and I are going to collaborate on when do I need this built? Is the city going to bring their share of money to build it? Um, am I going to be willing to wait for the city to build it? And if not, I'm going to enter into an agreement with the city that says I'll build it, but you're going to give me credits then for what I spent. And those credits offset my impact fees on my project. And if I still have credits left, I can use them on other projects throughout the city. Okay, so getting to that credit point, right? Because you're not just talking about the the project that they have that they need for their particular development. It's also impact to the additional infrastructure beyond the development, right? Correct. Okay, okay so I have to understand how those credits work so you understand that because in the, in the trust fund world, they're, they're building it for whatever it needs to reach their system at the size it's required in the master plan. Some cases, yes. Some cases on trust fund, it may feel, you know, serve their project primarily and not other things for the master plan or it's being added to the master plan to reflect that. This is now saying the master plan is saying this is the size that the system needs to support long range growth and how does your project compare to that? Okay, it may be so the that, same, it may be different. The devil's in the details here, yes. right? Uh, so what we're seeing is kind of the 50,000 foot view and not the details as to how those credits are going to be implemented, what's going to be affected, how it's going to... Um, Councilman, so, those are the policies well, that we'll, we'll be working on and bringing Well, I understand forward. that, but what you're referring to when you give the indication that the difference is $1,000 and $1,600, 662, I don't think that gives the full picture. And so I need to understand how those credits work because they're, we're still going to be putting, uh, uh, I mean, there's still the requirement to build a facility. They're not going to, developers aren't going to wait for the city to do it. It takes us freaking three years to do anything. Uh, so uh, it, it, it's going to be a, a cost anyway. So I just need to understand how that credit system works because do you get the credit for what you actually build or is it only a portion based on how you impact other infrastructure? It'll be a portion depending on what your demand is versus that improvement, and that's going to be a case by case. That policy, we will be bringing those forward in June uh, for discussion. SEAC will be looking at those at their first meeting in June, talking through those. We have talked about ideas, but we have not yet tackled the draft policies. The goal is to have these key policies ready by July when you take action to consider impact fees. Okay, so we can't say the difference is $662 because we don't know what that is yet based on credits. Well, we know that, but each project will be different because today they build the line and pay a lot fee. So fundamentally, we're still talking about likely building a line and paying an impact fee, but there may be some offset benefits that come with the credits or not come with the credits. And those will be on a case-by-case -case basis. We can do some examples once we have uh, the policies kind of vetted through the SEAC and look at what that means. We can take some example projects for sure. Okay, so I, just for my own personal comfort here, I don't like voting on things. I don't have a, a clear idea of what the actual costs are when you factor in all the, you know, nefarious kind of possibilities could be based on an individual basis. So it's, it, 
you know, until you have something firm to stand on, it's very hard to move forward in asking us to approve something when you don't really understand the complete impact. We understand. No pun, no pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> did, did anybody have any other questions or comments? Okay. Thank you. I think there was only I, one last I, slide. I essentially but. was saying the same thing as Gil. <laughs> I just took the shorter answer. <laughs> oh. Details. The only other last slide that's here, if it'll ever switch, is one that really talks about what will be the timing of payment of impact fees. That, yeah, depending on where you point. And it, what's shown on the slide, and it's in your packet, it gives the explanation that's in 395. And really, long story, and this is one of the policies also they'll be looking at, you know, there are some options of collecting it at, you know, building permit, meter connection, or time of platting, depending on whether you're inside the city limits or outside the city limits. What seac has been talking about, and I think where what the policy is going to land, is that will be paid at the time of building permit and meter. And so this is just kind of talking. Councilman Pesley? You, you said a while ago in your explanation of the, of, of the fees that if the developer decides to go in and do a project and they put up their fees, and you said, and then they wait on the city to put up their portion. So in projects I, that are on the master plan, there a portion of them is associated with growth and a portion of them is not necessarily, it's a project by project basis. So if the, you know, Moses comes in and says, I need this uh, 12 inch water line and CCW says, well, in the master plan, it's an 18. Okay, I'll change it. JJ's decided he's gonna be a developer and JJ came in and asked for this 12 inch line. Give it to Moses is like, why me? Why are you picking on me? You're, you're, all, you're almost there, Kara. Bart's next. And yeah, <laughs> well, we know. The there developer. we go. We're gonna say it's Bart's doing it. And Bart says, I want a six, but everyone tells him he needs a 12 and the master plan says an 18. Uh, the city would then have that responsibility to say your project needed a 12, but the master plan says 18. They need to contribute their share of the cost and construct that with you. If they say, hey, we're not ready to go build that job, that project now in the timeline that BART wants, which is, you know, a reasonable assumption, BART's going to enter into a development agreement with CCW that outlines what his costs obligations are, what the city's cost obligations are, and how that then gets constructed. And at some point, you would, the expectation would be that the city would reimburse the developer for those funds. Correct. Okay. The preference in that is that city is paying jointly when he's building that project. The less likely, you know, the less desirable scenario is he's paying the city's share and then they're reimbursing him for that share. Kind of like a developer and, trust yeah, well, I was going to ask, how is that different from the trust? So what, with trust funds, they have to wait for the trust fund to collect that money from individual lots being platted. With impact fees, the city has the ability to use that money to sell bonds to help accelerate that payback. If what if the, the city, city doesn't, doesn't like fund. that project? What if the city says, you know, I, I, you know, there's not much development going on where you're wanting to put your development, and we, we think you should go somewhere else for that project? City does not, through anywhere in this process or any of your code, have the ability to say, you can't build there because we don't like it. If it's well, on well, the they, master plan... They wouldn't that, say that. They would just say, we're not going to participate. Well, they're going to have to reimburse those costs if it's in the master plan and they choose one way or the other. They do not have the ability to say we're never going to pay. Or they can say, no, we really don't want to do that. We think we don't need that in the next 10 years or anything else will need it. You can build a lesser size line and they can grant that okay. opportunity. All right, and the and last thing I want to say is we keep referring to these fees are going to be paid by the developer. They're going to be passed paid on the, 
to the homeowners. Correct. The homeowners are going to be paying these fees. Correct. Bart? Mr. The oh. Chairman was oh. first. Michael. I think it's important to point out to Councilman Pusley, to your point. I, I can't hear you, Michael. Those mics are not working. Here, here, here. Hello, hello. Yeah. You to your to point, it. if you know, if you, your example, what if we don't want that development to happen there, right? Since this is designed to address growth, that would be more than likely a voluntary out annexation case, where they would say, hey, you know, we want to develop this and we want to be annexed this particular zoning district or whatever. At that point, you can say no, right? Because uh, we've been running into this a lot in planning commission with new developments that are outside of our extraterritorial jurisdiction or, or whatever, because those are the types of projects where you know it severely compromises either a trust fund or impact fees or anything else because you're having to extend city services way beyond the the boundaries of the city. I, I, I get that totally. I mean, I, but that's not what I'm referring to. I'm referring to inside the incorporated area of the city of Corpus Christi. If the city decided that, hey, I, you know, this project is kind of stepping out in an area where there's not much growth going on. And my concern has always been that, that this puts too much power in the hands of the city to decide where growth is taking place. Now you shake your head no, but nobody's convinced <coughs> me of that yet. Well, the city has the ability, if a developer truly is going somewhere, the city can say, no, nope, we know it's in our master plan. We don't, just like Michael talked about policies today, where you're saying, nope, this stresses our system, or no, we don't want to extend out that far. Uh, the city can say no, and the developer can build only what they need for their project and go forward. Bart? And as the council is familiar with the vocabulary of the trust fund, I, I, I think some of the terms may be helpful. The, the term reimbursement was just mentioned. This, this is not a reimbursement. This is the city paying its costs and the developer paying his costs and then the developer and then the bill, the homeowners paying a fee versus what we have today, which is a reimbursement and the city doesn't pay any money. So. This actually, in a bigger project, costs the city money because they have to participate on the oversize beyond what the subdivision itself needs, where right now that's not the case. So the term reimbursement was used, and, and, and that's how it's referred to, and, and I, it took me some time to get used to that. That is how it's referred to, but it's, a, it's not really, not in the sense that the trust fund is a reimbursement. This actually costs the city money. Councilman Roy. So I, I think Bart actually clarified my part of my question I was going to ask. Um, but I want to understand the scenario using the 18 inch pipe. So if Bart has a project and he thinks for his subdivision it only needs a 12, but the master plan requires an 18, we're, we're basically saying that the city would only require Bart to. Um, pay the amount up to the 12 inches, the city would pick up the additional six. Correct. And, or if he decided to go ahead and do the 18 and he would get credit in the future? Correct. Okay. Um, but can the city, I think this goes back to what council member Pusley was saying, can the city then say, well, we think it's going to be an 18 and I mean, there's nothing that can stop that project, is, I guess, is what I'm really asking. Correct. No, there's not. I mean, the city, if the city refuses to pay that share because they've decided for something other reason not to proceed with that larger size, BARC can be released from that and build the smaller line. It's, what's the possibility, because I know right now, under the current way that we do things, that what if... Um, if the city didn't agree, can Bart go back and say, okay, then let's just change the master plan to 12 on that section? He can request an amendment. Um, okay. You know, the 18 was in, in this example, was in the impact fee calculation, yeah. and 
was included and was planned, was looked at in the land uses by the committee, you know, and said, we think, yes, the model says we need that line. I mean, I, some of it is going to be encouraging both departments and developers on both sides to say, we work together on this master plan, you know, th this is what's important in it. But go ahead, Bart. To Councilman Roy's point, that is a concern that was discussed several times in several SEAC meetings, which is, if it's on the city's master plan, can the city say, we don't want you to go out there? That, has, that was discussed several times, which is one of the reasons the policies are so important. If, if, the, if, if the city can, and it's what Councilman Pusley was referring to, that, that has to be dealt with in, in the policies. Can you do that? Because the further out you go, the higher the cost to the city. Sure. And so that's a real concern. If it's a 30-inch line that has to go out, you know, and, uh, in Corpus, three miles is a long way. If it's a 30 inch line, but my subdivision only, or Moses' subdivision only needs a six inch, guess who pays for the 24? And let me make this statement uh, to, uh, uh, because I think it's important, and I think uh, Councilman Roy c kind of lean leaned on this is that. The master plans that you adopted uh, in January, always uh, everything we have still has an amendment process. And keep in mind, as I said earlier, our growth rate is, depending on who you listen to, is it's one percent or less, right? Which means that uh, the master plan that has this projected growth over the next ten years may may come very, very slowly, which means that then if BART or someone says, hey, I want to I do this project, but the line is showing, I don't know, 24 inch, but the current, you know, you know, many of us can't see far in the future to say, we'll never need that line. You can always request a master plan amendment, right? We still have that process. That's one of the first policies, right, that we worked on. Uh, with SEAC, with the with other developers and stakeholders, so uh, and and it'll be one of the policies that we bring forward to you also. So nothing really, I don't want to say controls us from thinking outside the box, uh, based on uh, the the unattractive way that that the numbers show our city is growing. So yes, the CIP shows a master plan going for the next ten years, you know, rocking and rolling, but. That only happens if growth occurs, and if growth doesn't occur, then the amendment to the master plan may be the logical step to get a project going. So I, I, want, I want to make sure none of that is gone, right? You still can come and say, I want to amend the master plan because of X, Y, and Z. So with that said, I, and I wanted to kind of address Councilman Puzzley's first question he asked when he says, why, why is there no number for runoff for commercial, right? So I'm going to give uh, the chair uh, of SEAC, Moses, an opportunity to kind of, you know, introduce everyone if you want to, uh, uh, begin to discuss why uh, they, what were their, what was their thinking and their process to get to the recommendations that they made. So Moses, if you will. Yeah, I'll take that one. There you go. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm Moses. Uh, we've got our SEAC committee here. I saw a couple people come in late, but they're good and they're here. Uh, so the first question Mr. Pusley had is about the storm drain. So the city of Corpus Christi has an IDM right now. Uh, the IDM requires land developers to, and I can talk a little bit more, requires land developers to detain their water. So if you think of a farm field right now, uh, there's a ratio of water that falls off a farm field because it has no impervious cover and a part of the IDM it requires land developers whether it's residential apartments shopping centers and this has everything to do that goes into the Oso Basin so the stormwater fee isn't for the amount of water or the infrastructure that's placed on our properties it's about getting into the OSO. It actually just relates to the OSO itself. So the fees are going to five detention pond projects that the city would have to do eventually, which one is on Clarkwood, one is an expansion project of OSO, uh, and some larger ditches out from the London area to OSO. 
Everything on the other side of SBID automatically has a zero attached to it because it goes straight into the bay. So if it goes straight into the bay, it's not hurting or adding to the infrastructure uh, capacities that we have right now, which is told we are at full capacity. So land developers already have to do detention uh, according to the IDM, and an impact fee is a fee that is placed on anything that goes vertical that creates impervious cover. And if you look at an individual lot, we assessed individual lots at a the minimum of $100 uh, to allow those dollars to eventually be used on those detention sites in the OSO. But we didn't put anything on commercial because and, and, we, and really you could put the same argument towards lots even though we assessed $100 for the lots. Uh, commercial right now, apartment complexes, shopping centers, anything SBID from uh, Ayers to the Laguna Madre is where the impact fees could apply, but they're already required to do what they have to, whether it's a pond, whether it's oversizing of pipes, whether it's zigzagging of pipes to make sure that when they have their parking lot set and when they have their building set that that runoff is the exact same as it was when it was a farm field so if that's the case land developers or the people developing the properties already spend the money to detain their water so they're theoretically not adding an impact to the infrastructure because their impact is already calculated when it's a farm field so that's why we assessed it at zero. So everything in the Cal Allen area that goes straight into the bay already is assessed at zero, regardless if we had an impact fee, mainly because anything that goes straight into the bay uh, does not impact the OSO, and the impact fee is specifically for the OSO basin system. So you're giving them credit for what they've had to spend? They're not going to get a credit. They're well, not going to have an when impact. When I say you're giving, them credit, you're giving them credit for the fact that they've had to put in uh, I would system. call it not. I wouldn't call it a credit. I would say that they're not going to pay another fee because they're already doing what they have yeah. to on site because they're not impacting the system. Yeah. Okay. So they, yeah. No. Yeah, I'm saying the same thing. Now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The going back to the question here, what is the cost basis, right? And I think I had this conversation with Moses about this on what the cost is based on. So, for example. It would cost us two and three times as much to do something as a city as it would a private developer. So are we using their cost or are we using our cost to base these fees on or these credits on? The, the capital improvement projects were based on the city's capital improvement cost. So it's the city's cost. Okay, so I mean. Because there's no way we could use a developer's cost to, right? There's no way, I don't. We don't know their operation. But they're paying a lot less than we are. Of course, but there's no way I could use their cost. Okay, so here, here's, here's the conundrum with that. If you're using our cost, they could probably build something, uh, an 18-inch line for what it costs us to build a 6-inch line. So the, what we look at when we get to the point of a development agreement, and now you have an agreement between the city and the developer, and it says, yes, the developer is going to build this. The developer still has to go through a bidding process because ultimately public dollars are involved. But the final price for credits and for what the city is owed is based on that actual bid price and what they actually spend versus based on an estimate. So like the impact, the trust funds right now go off of an estimated cost. These, go ahead, Bart. But to your point, Councilman, the fee is based upon city cost. The actual, so the fees are inflated, so to speak. Uh, the actual project is based upon the developer's cost at the time. And, you know, we can say fees are inflated. City, yes, Relative. typically sees a higher cost than a developer pays. Yeah. We've all experienced it. But that's part of that process. Remember, we said, what's that maximum cost? And we cut, cut it, it in half. And so there's a lot, that cut in half exercise is to say, there's a lot of unknown, 
there's a lot of contingency, there's a lot of high level planning versus when you get to construction of a project and you spend a lot more detail. Moses, were you? Y'all were no, was passing around, okay. Just moving in front of me in case somebody asks a question. So. Okay. How, how many more people are we gonna need at the city to administer this process versus what we're doing now? Because this seems like we're adding a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of calculations for individual projects. Uh, that's an inter interesting question, Councilman. I don't, I don't really perceive adding personnel. We just have to have a, a, a way of operating, right? And what I didn't say to you, which is I should have said before, I, I see you smiling, Councilman Hunter, uh, is that uh, if this is approved by Council in July, uh, we're recommending not starting implementation of impact fees until October 1st, 2025. In that time period, we hopefully will have worked out uh, the policies, uh, the robust policies from credits to uh, redevelopment to other issues that are, that are kind of hanging in the balance and then uh, also developing the, the operating mechanism, me mechanisms to, to implement this process. I don't really see a staff of, of, of a bunch of individuals. Yes. Oh, yes, that's right. It might just, Michael just told me, Michael Dice, everyone, he said, he said our trust, the staff that works on the trust funds will, will do this, will transition to this. Okay. Which, in my, which in my department is three individuals. Councilman Roy. So I want to go back and kind of review what you were saying. Let's just say, and I'll, I'll use Bart again as an example, that he has to build this 8 and 10 inch pipe are you saying that in, in terms of quoting the cost that he has to get three because it's it's That's it's city funds that he's got to get three bids? Doesn't have to be three bids, but he has to publicly solicit advertise for bids. Has to be a competitive bid process because public dollars are involved being spent ultimately. So that's gonna kind of increase his staffing. I don't know if you have staff that does that. So you would, is that the normal process that you do now? Well, probably not, right? Not the, the, the trust fund process includes approval of a bid <coughs> by the city, not trip, not three competitive bids. So the, the, the city uh, approves the, the final cost. Now, so I mean, I, I, again, a policy question, Councilman, that we talked about that would need to be resolved is, is does that stay the same or do we have to go into the, those, those other steps? So to, I'm, I'm sure to, to interpret what Bart said is no, it's not required now. Uh, as uh, I think uh, Kara said or Moses said, an estimate is given and the city just takes the estimate for trust fund cost, right? In this case, uh, on impact fees, when I enter, enter into a, a, a development agreement or a utility service agreement, uh, it's city dollars, uh, sorry, public money being spent, so there has to be some competitive process, whether it's three bids or, or whatever it is to show, hey, look, I competitively got this number uh, from X, Y, and Z, and this is really what I want to go with, right? So uh, uh, there, there's nothing wrong with how the process works now, but in, in this world, it would work much different. Can I ask a question on that? Just honestly, that's the first time we've heard that. So I want to give a scenario because I watch how council picks their stuff, right? So 18 inch line gets, uh, needs to be constructed. We go out to three competitive bidders who quote unquote check what boxes. Is it the same boxes that council has to be checked for for bond bidding? And then do we have to pick the lowest bidder for, or is the lowest amount actually accepted, even if we don't quote unquote like that contractor? I mean, how's, how is that state law or is that policy? It's policy that can set the process by which okay. you pick the qualified low bidder. And many of us as engineers, many, many times on you can specify the qualifications that come along with that bid. Because well, 
going back to it, I mean, again, you're going to have one, a subdivision is going to have one line item that qualifies under a reimbursement. But a subdivision has 300 other line items. You as have far zero as requirement to bring your whole subdivision into that process, only that piece we, of infrastructure. So you would typically build, you know, bid that, you in this case would bid that water or sewer line separate than you would your whole subdivision so that because your subdivision you're likely talking to your but, favorite contractor and moving forward but again okay i guess it's going to come down to the policy but as a developer right a contractor does a whole job cheaper than he does cherry picking the certain parts of a job so you might get three bids with this contractor that says hey, here are the prices for the sewer line, but then you go get three bids without that sewer line, and it skews what they're going to charge you for that as well. So, I mean, that's an interesting uh, process. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know that was a part of policy. Well, the policy on how you do that as a developer is not part of the city policy. But, but I mean, I'm saying how you manage that as a developer but, to best manage that pricing. Yeah. But are we going to be using the city bond policy as a, stand, a standard way of the bid process, or are we creating a policy? We're this, this creating committee? a policy that shows okay. you have solicited competitive bids. So this is changing the nature, right? So you have a current trust fund that is not sick money. It's basically a fund that's being collected in by the city for the uh, for development, so it's not, so city policies are not applicable to the spending of that of those dollars, right? It's whatever the trust fund is. So by going to impact fees, you this becomes city dollars, and to reimburse, they have to follow city policies, which, which really causes our cost to go up by two or three times. So you're creating an upward pressure on cost by having those policies in place by changing the. From a trust fund to an impact fee. Is is that a question, Councilman? Or I mean, you're making. No, a I'm comment. asking. Is that correct? Is that statement correct? I, it's. Uh, I don't want to say it's an opinion. Uh, however, we're going to work with the stakeholders, including SEAC, to develop a policy that is amenable, amenable across the board. But yes, you're going from. Uh, you know the the trust funds are, are documented uh, specifically in the in the UDC. Uh, this is a state policy that does ump, up the ante and the qualifications and all of the requirements uh, because it's it's um, it's kind of following a state process. So to your comments may be correct, but but what that is that impact no pun intended. We really don't know until we actually get into kind of how we want to manage this policy this process okay so that goes back to my original mention is that you're asking us to to go forward with something we don't know the full impact no pun intended of the decision would be I know I know so it that may be true right so but I'm committed uh, to each and every one of you laughing or not I'm committed to to bringing to you as a brief what we've worked on, we collectively, SEAC, the operating departments, us, uh, the policies that will be utilized to implement what you'll be voting on in July. I'm committed to bringing that to you in a briefing as a draft in the month of June. So you're not going to be in the dark, right? And it should remove some of your angst because you'll be able to, uh, um, how can I say, you'll be able to interject, to add, to discuss. But, but Al, I'm going to interrupt you really quickly because I think some, for example, the example uh, that Moses was talking about, we really don't necessarily know yet. That's going to be created. Correct. Within these next, I think weeks, you said eight yes. weeks or months? Weeks. Uh, because I want to bring the draft to you. We are already working on it. Uh, Buck sent me the ordinance today, the draft ordinance, right? We're already working on this. So I want to bring it to council as a briefing draft uh, in the month of June before you actually have to vote on impact fees in the month of July. 
Yes, it won't be. Uh, you may say, hey, I want to do this and do that. So it won't be necessarily finalized, but you'll know exactly what is the intent of the policies that will drive this system. Well, I'm going to take Moses' example on bidding in this whole discussion. The city may not want to set the policy so rigid where you say you have to follow our bond project policy. They may want to give more leeway to the developer to say you need to get competitive bids so that we know that this is a full and open process. However, what Moses may do is he's going to look to JJ and Chad and uh, Eli and say, okay, I need estimates from this from you. Well, Eli doesn't build subdivisions, so she may say, I'm only going to give you a bid on this water line. JJ may build everything and say, I'm going to give all of the pricing, but I'm going to give you just this line item as a component of my whole thing, so you can compare my line item to Eli's standalone bid. There are ways that a developer can manage that still show they did a disclosure and competitive process that lets them manage those costs and work with contractors to manage right. those costs. Okay, Michael Miller and then Everett Roy. Um, so the vote in July and the subsequent adoption in October of 2025, there's no additional vote in October, right? It's just this is the adoption date and we got to work out all the details between July and October. The goal is to get correct. There is no additional vote. SEAC was very clear that their recommendation would be that council, if they voted in July to move forward with impact fees, that that would say policies had to be in place prior to implementation. They were very clear that if policies aren't done, it shouldn't be implemented. And that was part of what they were asking council to make sure their ordinance said. The goal is to bring forward those major items and policies by July so that the council does have an opportunity with input from SEAC to say, yeah, we really know how this big stuff's going to happen. But if, if something doesn't get worked out between July and October, that's a potential issue. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring this up because, I, and I brought it up three times already, but I want to make sure that everybody understands that once we start collecting impact fees, we cannot use the proceeds from those funds to pay off balances or reconcile balances within the trust fund. And so I've asked several times, you know, how will the, the remaining balances within the trust fund be reconciled? And the answer I always get is, well, we got to figure that out. So is there, um, if you can't quote unquote figure that out, or if there's a policy issue between July and October that nobody thought about that can't get uh, figured out, what's the process for abandoning ship? You know, I love Mike right. Miller. He always um, always asks questions that uh, make me um, think. Um, we are currently, we, the operating departments, legal, we're currently working in the fifth floor, of course, with Peter and his team, working on uh, a transition of trust funds, right? As you know, we're approximately, uh, Sorry, we're approximately 2.5 or so million dollars in the in the red, right? Uh, and and Peter wants to to make sure that uh, there's an um, a systematic way to transition from what we're doing now to what we hopefully want to do if council approves it. That transition also includes how do we settle this this deficit, right? Obviously, every single day, uh, because when I came to this group before, I, the number was closer to five, right? Well, every single day, people are platting, as Bart said, and, and the plat requires payment of lot and acreage fees, surcharge fees for meters, those kind of things, right? Uh, and ultimately, as Bart would say, and we don't always agree on this, if you leave the trust funds alone, it'll get back to where, where it balances itself. I don't necessarily agree with Bart on that because the, the ask is so much greater than the, than the payout, right? And that's why the, the deficit keeps growing. 
Peter is of a mindset that we cannot rely on it to pay out itself. So he is, you know, we reached out to our bond council and we've gotten some recommendations and, and that's kind of what we're reviewing now, right? So uh, eventually we'll come before council and say, hey, this is our transition plan for trust funds. And, and if we adopt impact fees, but even if we don't, we still have to put a plan that says, hey, this is what we're gonna do with trust funds. Because right now, if we keep going with trust funds, now we're talking, years out of payment and, and, and who can carry that kind of financing for, for that long period of time, right? So that would involve, and I know this is, not a, this is not germane to this discussion, but that would involve changing the whole trust fund process so it's, it's profitable, it, it works for everyone, right? So that whole thing is kind of, a, a, I don't wanna say hanging in the balance, but it is, it is the secondary plan should, should this not move forward, right? Because we need to address that because it's, it is the the negative growing balance is is it's almost uh, it's really challenging to to kind of look at it and 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 think that uh, eventually it'll get back to to balance zero zero. So we're working on that to answer your question, and hopefully we'll bring something also in the month of June that addresses how we would want to transfer. Yes, sir. The ejector seat question, though. I'm sorry, sir. The ejection seat question. If if this is if Council votes on it and decides that it passes in July and there's policy issues between July and October, what would be required for council to overturn its previous vote? Well, as, as, as Kara said, the recommendation that will go to council in July that SEAC made is that, hey, we, we want to recommend these, these impact fees. However, uh, if the policies policies are not in place, it ju you just push the can down the road until the policies are in place, and then implementation can occur. So we're looking to to start implementation October 1, 2025. Clearly, we, we're going to have our policy standing up by then. But if something should happen and we don't, I understand it'll just be pushed until we get dot our eyes and cross our t's on uh, whatever is outstanding. Yes, Councilman Roy. So maybe I missed this part, but as far as the policy goes, who is actually taking the lead on this? Is SEAC going to have? Um, Great question. Are you going to go through the same process? Great. Are you going to continue the process, or is it going to be city staff working mainly on the policies Great. and then briefing? Great SEAC? question. Uh, the SEAC chair is going to establish a subcommittee of, of the SEAC members working with the operating departments, working with uh, development services and our legal team to develop the policies that are needed, right? And then that's what we'll hopefully have a good draft and bring to council in the month of June, which is next month, uh, as a draft briefing to say, hey, this is what we're working on, this is what we think, the good, the bad, the ugly, so to speak. And uh, hopefully that'll, with your input, that'll be a, a, at a point, we'll be at a point where you're not like uh, nervous like Councilman Hernandez saying, I don't really know. Well, hopefully we'll provide everything that, that gives you the ability to know how we're going to operate. Good luck. Thank you for that. Yeah, we, we can't help that. That's going to happen on everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, so it's SEAC. Moses is going to establish a, uh, the SEAC chair, SAR, is going to establish a subcommittee, and that subcommittee is going to work with us, with the operating departments, with legal, to, to you know, the dot to eyes across the T's to get the policy uh, developed so we can have a draft briefing for you, and oh, Mike just uh, shared with me, the briefing is in July, not the month of June, right? Uh, and, and I ha ha go on, Bart, please. Yes, my friend Al and I have had many colorful conversations about the trust fund, but just, just as I hate to be the guy in the room that remembers way back when, I don't know when that happened. I used to be Chad, now I'm, I don't know what happened. <laughs> um, the trust fund has been in a, neg a deficit status numerous times since it was created. Um, uh, it, 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 and it, it's a pay-as-you-go. So by definition, if someone starts a project and realizes it's 10 years before they can get paid and they start anyway, they've worked that into their plan. Just one other comment. We only built 860 homes in 2023. 860. That's less than, a hundred, that's less than 200 acres that needed to be developed for one year. Our, 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 our typical, you know, over the last seven, eight years has been around 1,000 to 1,100. 
we're on path again this year for eight, almost 860, almost on the money. So the trust fund has functioned because it, it's kind of set, it's functioned to date because it's kind of set for the growth we actually experience here. Our, uh, and and, and the, the growth that's projected is 1.3%. It's actually been about 1%. We, we had that discussion several times. It's actually been 1% or less. So even if you do the math, it's a, if it goes back to an average year, two years from now, that's 1,100, then maybe 1,200. That's 205 acres a year. The, the, so that's why the trust fund works as it does, because it's about, it's about set for the market that we're in. If we suddenly went to 3,000, which some of these cities that you see their, their uh, impact fees on of $29,000, now again, remember that's just water and wastewater. Twenty-nine thousand dollars a lot. That's used to slow down the growth. They want to stop people from coming, and so councils and and other government entities charge those kind of fees. It, it's expensive to grow a city at three or four times its existing rate, but those are disincentives to growth. Uh, this this number is a pretty. If we have to have an impact fee, it's a it's a pretty good number. It's a pretty good number. But the reason that I just wanted to stress that trust fund is exactly where it's been before five or six times since I've been doing this. Four I or five times. I want to make one. You know, Bart and I are good frenemies, right? Uh, love him to death. I'll do anything for him and try to facilitate, even though sometimes he really is a thorn in my side. But I, but I want to make this statement, and this is a, this is a factual statement about the trust funds. In 19, from 1982 to 2022, the trust funds paid out approximately $40 million. Now, I need you to wrap your, your head around what I'm telling you. The trust funds paid out $40 million to anyone who's developed, like Bart was saying. Right now, in the, holding, we're, right now, we're holding trust fund requests for about $17 million. That's almost half of what it paid out in his lifetime. We can't, that's what, and I've had this conversation with Bart a million times and he doesn't understand. We can't keep up. If, if, if we come to council and say, here, here, approve all these, uh, these agreements, you're talking about 20 years for payout. That's assuming that you still have people platting and development is still flowing even at our righteous 1% growth. So I just want to, I'm not saying anything's wrong with it. I just think the times have changed and wow, I've got $17 million waiting to get before council and Peter's going, hold on, we got to figure out how we're going to, how we're going to pay for this, right? If we let the trust fund go as it has gone, because he's right, the balance, it's, 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 it's seasonal, right? It goes up, it goes down. And in 2006, when they stopped it, I think it was a, you know approaching, I don't know, maybe zero or 100 grand or whatever negative. It's never seen these kind of negative numbers before, per se. Okay. So uh, anyway, so. Uh, but Bart, I, I have to ask, so what, what is your response to that, for example? $17 million. To, that, to, to be fair, that I, I think the, the key to it is in 2021, the policies of the trust fund were changed. The actual internal policies, and that, that is a big part of this. The other part is, uh, going back to Moses, you might remember too, 2017, uh, and Al has been good at doing it since, but the trust fund is supposed to be looked at, and, and by the way, I don't mean to be a defender of the trust fund, I just happen to have experienced it. And so, y'all know more about it than about impact fees, so that's why I was trying to relate that to, to what we're hearing today. But when the trust fund policies changed, when you take more money out of something than you put in, it's going to run out of money. Right. And that, that, that was a big part of it. Uh, and and, and it's it certainly, and, and if you don't charge enough. Right. And that's what happened. Going back to 2017, the Builder Association reminded the staff, and it wasn't, Al was not in place, it was before that. Going back over in that, hey, the trust funds are supposed to be increased each year. There are, I think it's every two years, actually, they're supposed to be looked at. So they're probably low from what they should be right now. So the, these guys have a challenge. No, I don't, I don't mean to uh, underestimate it, but there were reasons that it functioned for 40 years and then didn't. 
Okay. I want to make, I uh, want to correct one other statement, Mayor. I'm sorry, go on. Well, Councilman Presley was next and then. Yeah, I, yeah further to what Mark's saying, I, Al, I guess I would ask, when was the last time that the trust fund was evaluated for uh, the cost increases that we have seen since the pandemic? You know, there has to be some adjustment for that. And then there has to be an adjustment every year, uh, or at least every couple of years for increases in the trust fund. So I'm not sure that's a fair comparison, but the current trust fund handles water and wastewater only. With the SEAC fee, we're going to handle water, wastewater, and, storm water, and a nominal fee for stormwater and nothing for transportation. And I was always under the assumption we were going to include something for transportation, but that, that's okay. But so let me, uh, let's assume for a moment that the trust fund was flush, that it had plenty of money and Bart's going to go put in a subdivision and he's got to put in a lift station that cost a half a million dollars. And he says to the city, I'm going to put the lift station in and then I'll expect to get reimbursed for that half a million dollars. Is he going to get reimbursed at 100% of his investment for that lift station? The trust fund reimburses 100%, yes. Okay, and how would the SEAC reimburse him if he spent that same amount of money? He would ha he'd be he would be required to pay. Yeah, talk loud, Al. I, um, I apologize, sir. He would be required to pay the the impact fee for stormwater, which is uh, help me. Is it uh, 612? If it's a commercial, ought to be based. I assume it's home, so he'd be ha he'd be required to pay the impact fee of 612 dollars per lot of development, and then the city would, uh, as as Kara was saying, the city would then uh, say, okay, Bart, uh, thank you for the impact fee. We have. Per state law, we have two years to design it, five years to complete it. If that's not fast enough, as you have said, then he would enter into agreement with the operating department to say, hey, uh, I'll, I'll name that tune for this, and they would negotiate what would be required, and he'd enter into a development agreement. It would be brought before you guys for approval, and he's off to the races. And then okay. he would get reimbursed or, and impact fee credits for building the lift station or whatever it is. So he's not going to get reimbursed in funds. He's going to get reimbursed in credits for his next project. Yes. OK. And, and you made a, a I'm sorry, go on. So uh, what happens in the case that there is no next project? Then he sits on uh, a few credits. <laughs> But that's why we allowed the, I'm sorry, that's one of the reasons why SEAC created the one service area for water, wastewater, and, and, and uh, stormwater, so that you can use credits from Cal Allen to the island, right? So if you got a project in Cal Allen, hey, I'm gonna start this project next year and on the island, or anywhere in between, you can use those credits, which, which is a benefit for, I think, developers who develop across, across the city. Yeah, but I get the point of retirement, let's say, right? And then, yes. These credits, credits, right? He can, and by the way, he can always sell the credits to Moses since okay. uh, he's a young man and still building, right? So uh, he can always sell it to the next uh, builder and developer. He's got two. He's got two. You're my age, man. <laughs> I'm sorry. He said, "What if he's retiring and I just used Moses?" But forgive me. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, but uh, Councilman Puzzley made a comment that was really interesting. I'm surprised no one has even even commented on is that uh, Councilman Puzzley said, hey, look, uh, why are we not charging for commercial, right? And Moses kind of addressed that. But the real important thing is, is roads, right? Uh, SEAC is recommending zero for roads. And if you look outside, one would think, if we need anything, we need roads, better Amen. roads, uh, finances for roads. So, uh, but. I assume Moses, Moses, if you want to address that, just so that everyone understands we're all on the same page, uh, I think your rationale is interesting. Uh, is David Loeb here? I can give him the microphone. No. Um, so what we talked about, so just to go back um, to the engineer's point, these are ultimately estimates, right? And the one thing that Corpus has is obviously road issues and we've got a public works department working on repavement plans. Impact fees do not cover maintenance. 
impact fees are for road infrastructure expansion. And the city of Corpus Christi, like most cities, everybody uses every road. So to say I built a subdivision off of Yorktown and I should pay $1,000 per vehicle, meaning the end user or the home buyer, people from the island, Flower Bluff, from downtown, drive down Yorktown because it's a corridor like SVID. So impact fees are only a small portion of the $1.5 billion that the CIP projects say we have as far as inadequate size roads for capacity. A land developer installs their own C1s, minor residential, over residential, um, collector streets in their neighborhoods at their own cost. The impact fee is for when the vehicle leaves that neighborhood and drives on every other road in the city. So our thought process, since you have 21 service areas and these are credits because we'll always be doing things ahead of the city in 21 service areas because state law requires that to be 21 service areas and SEAC has no control of making it one service area. We did like what most cities have done is not enacted a actual impact fee on the roads because that's where you get really arbitrary. First you're starting with a 1.5 billion dollar amount that we know and the engineers know and staff knows is unobtainable. Uh, if you listen to David Loeb's last uh, conversation, you'd be tearing down houses and cemeteries and other things to attain even what's called maximum build out. Now, if we become the size of Austin and we have a population of a, mil a million people or more, potentially other roads will get bigger. But the, the, the example is this is a $1.5 billion number and ultimately everybody drives on the roads. Now, do you, when you build a school or a shopping center or a subdivision, does it have an impact on an arterial road? The simple answer is yes, but the impact is, in our eyes, minimal compared to the impact of how just traffic flows in the city as a norm, and property taxes pay for that. And uh, most of the time, road expansions are done, done through bond dollars. If a developer does a subdivision, they're required to get a TIA, and if there's oversized roads in their development, they bear the cost of that with some cost sharing done with the city currently, because again, those are your UTB master plan roads that eventually tie into another neighborhood, tie into another neighborhood, and become corridors. Uh, simple example is Lipes. Lipes is in a uh, four-lane road because of the high school or the apartment complexes or the subdivision it's because it connects airline and Cimarron together so yeah. I, I don't disagree with any of that Moses except for the fact that you know one of our biggest issues in the city is residential streets and once you build a subdivision correct me if I'm wrong you are responsible for care and maintenance for two years is that right yeah so we years. have a two-year maintenance we right. require we're required to warranty the street for two years not maintenance it yeah. if d people damage it or you know utility departments come damages that's still a city issue not right. a land developer we're we're warranting the structure the underlining testing and the base work and the asphalt as if normal wear and tear happened on it but, but beyond if, that two years uh -huh the city's responsible for the care and maintenance. You know, we have a $900 million problem currently with respect to neighborhood streets. And, and so, impact fees wouldn't be able to pay for a dollar. No, I understand that, problems. but on a go forward basis, I mean, just like we're, we're adding $100 per rooftop for uh, stormwater, mm -hmm. why would it not be appropriate, Al, in our policies to put $100 a rooftop for street? Be because impact fees, no impact fee can be required to improve for maintenance or old infrastructure. The reason the stormwater has a hundred dollar fee to it is to expand infrastructure. So meaning oversize the OSO, create detention ponds, but you can't, the, what pays for maintenance of stormwater is the stormwater fee on your water bill. That's your curve cleaning, your inlet uh, cleaning with the vacuum machines even some 
cleaning and mowing of uh, drainage ditches. It doesn't allow, the $100 doesn't allow us to pay the guy who mows the grass. It allows you to make that drainage ditch from a 50 foot to a 100 foot for capacity purposes. So same thing here. If you applied any number, it's not for Ernie's crew to go out there and do any seal coating, no maintenance. It's only if you took it from two lanes to three lanes, three lanes to four lanes. It doesn't pay for the sidewalks. It doesn't pay for the rollover curves. It doesn't pay for any of that, and it never can by state law. And if we were using a trust fund, we wouldn't have that limitation. If you put, even if you had a trust fund and you added a road trust fund, which you can't because state law doesn't allow you to do trust funds anymore, so you can't enact that at this point, but even trust funds today don't pay for maintenance. That's going to be in the rate and your property taxes. So no, nothing, the only thing that this would do is take money from the end user, put it in a bucket to where if you do any road expansions, then those dollars can be used only in those service areas, and that's 21 different service areas. Whereas today, the city uses bonds and obviously capital improvement projects to do road expansions. So, Councilman, you made a, you've said something that I, you know, thought, oh, wow, I, did, I didn't mention it. <clears throat> but to add on to what Moses is saying, like the trust funds, impact fees expand new infrastructure. In this case, it adds ro roads and stormwater. But unlike the trust fund, it also can can uh, increase demand at the at the water treatment facility if required, if demand demands it, no pun intended, or at the wastewater treatment facility if demand requires it, right? So, but it can't be used, as Moses said, for any kind of maintenance or seal coating or that kind of thing. It only really is used to expand new infrastructure and to take care of that demand uh, at the treatment facility if, if, that is, if the numbers show that that's required uh, because of the development that's coming. I apologize, I didn't, I, I assumed everyone knew that. So uh, yeah, it, it doesn't deal with, with maintenance, right? So he mentioned the stormwater fee, which takes care of the existing stormwater system that we have, uh, uh, those kind of things. But impact fees will be much like trust funds in terms of it's just extending new you know, infrastructure uh, and then adding, you know, increasing other areas that re that demand requires to be increased. That's really all the money can be used for. Okay. Just, just for clarification on this, so, so uh, let me give you a hypothetical. Let's say if, if a new development causes a current collector street, which is a two-lane street, uh, to be expanded into a four-lane arterial street. Um, would the impact fee cover the additional cost of transitioning that road from a collector street into a arterial, even though that might take place maybe years after the development has taken place? Yes, uh, impact fees would be pay a portion. Like Moses says, it's really just a measure of cost sharing, right? The, let's say that growth of that collector from two lanes to, I don't know, four lanes is millions of dollars. The impact fee is only going to pay a, a percentage. It's it's the percentage that we're going to charge the developer to cost share in that, right? So it just prevents you and I as as residents from paying 100% of that. Well, now the developer will pay a, a small portion to, to help build the infrastructure. Can I comment on that? Sure. So as a land developer, what we do currently, and this goes for schools, this goes for commercial, when you develop a subdivision or you develop a shopping center or school, we give road right of ways for free to the city. Case in point, I'm dedicating 25 feet of, uh, which is an acre of frontage over 1,500 feet on Yorktown to the city of Corpus Christi so that when they want to expand, they're not tearing through my buildings, they're not tearing through structures. So right now what the master plans did is it dedicates or gives identification for full maximum right of way that the city need, which is a part of the cost of what an impact fee or the cost of a project is in your CIP projects. If you look at one of the line items, it's right of way uh, uh, inquirement. So land developers already share in a cost of road expansion by giving the land to the city at no cost through platting uh, as a part of a platting mechanism. Now, 
some other instances, and Del Mar is the perfect example on Yorktown, when a, when a high use area, HEB can be another one, we cut into our own properties and create right hand turn lanes and that's a part of road expansion. So the city has a two lane corridor that needs to be four lanes. It's never because of that one development. It's right. overall what happens on the whole street, but land developers do already participate by dedicating land for free. And in some cases, if it's on the commercial use or high uh, density use an apartment complex, uh, case in point, the example is on Lipes right now. The apartment complex is happening, and there was always that void where you had to go from two lanes to one lane, back to two lanes once you got to the stop sign at Bronx. Now that that apartment complex is happening, he is dedicating the land, he is putting in the road, and if it has too much traffic, then he'd have to put in a right-hand turn lane so it doesn't impede on the rest of the traffic, and if it even has more traffic in some cases you have to add a uh, traffic light or those different things that could be cost shared if it's in the cip projects on the traffic side so again that's another reason why that number and, and a lot of impact fees throughout the state traffic is put at zero because there's other ways or other systems that require land developers or developers in general to participate in road expansion not necessarily in formal dollars, but in the actual land, which in some cases is just as much in, in dollars. If you take an acre of commercial property on Yorktown, that's a million dollar, don't, a uh, million dollars worth of land I gave to the city just so they can widen the four lanes or five lanes when they so choose to. Thank you. I um, it's uh, a little after two o'clock, and I, um, I I was oh is there another question? I'm sorry, go on. I'm just going to take two minutes for this. <laughs> the vote on the C Act was 13 to two. I was one of the twos. The twos that voted against it were not voting against impact fees. We were voting against the value of the impact fees. We both felt they were too low. Impact fees are not arbitrary. It's a cost sharing. You can literally track every number in the impact fee directly from the CIP down to the max impact fee. And I, I went through a lot of these. Our committee proposed the CIP. You guys approved the CIP. So every number that goes through an impact fee related to growth, every number in the CIP related to growth flows into the impact fee. So it's not related to maintenance. It's not related to upkeep. It's only related to growth and a lot of these projects would not happen if there's no development. So the only time this kicks in is when there's development that then leads to expansion. So that's what the impact fees are, and there's a cost to the impact fees. And once a project is done, the developer does all their work, they build all their own stuff, and once they're finished, it's turned over to the city, and then the taxpayers and the ratepayers are forever responsible for maintaining it going forward. So the only question is, who's gonna share in the cost of the expansion up front? And that's pretty much what the impact fees are. We have all the calculations. We saw what the maximums that can be charged are. And we chose what in my, and I know I'm the dissenting opinion, but we chose what in my view is a very low number. What this basically does is put a large, it's not like it's in a vacuum. I mean, these are actual costs. This isn't a fee that's randomly chosen. These are actual costs that can be flowed from the CIP that determine impact fees. If you look at the total, and I counted, I totaled up the amount of total CIP related to growth over the decade, it's $2.09 billion. That's if every CIP project is done. Of that allocation, $1.6 billion would go to the taxpayer, and $470 million would go to the developer. And I say developer, builder, that whole category. Taxpayer, ratepayer, that whole category. But that's pretty much the allocation. It's about $1.6 billion to $470 million. I completely support impact fees. Our committee was not, we were immersed in impact fees. We were not really immersed in trust funds, so it's hard for me to really speak on how to connect the trust fund to the impact fee. Bart knows the trust fund better, but knowing what I know about impact fees, know what I'm knowing about growth, know what I know about the numbers flowing through. Me personally, I think that the impact fee should be higher. Uh, the stormwater, we assess basically 
if it wasn't clear, adopted is what we said, this is the most it could be, and assessed is where we actually put it. We adopted and assessed the stormwater at the highest. We adopted the transportation low and assessed at zero. And for the wastewater and water, we adopted basically at 50%, and then we assessed at half of that. So it's basically, we did a, the most we could for stormwater, zero for transportation, and half of what we could have for water and wastewater. Me personally, I think it's a cost sharing. I think the allocation should be higher to the developer side, which would take a burden off of the taxpayer. But our committee did vote 13-2 for the numbers you saw. And by the, oh, one last thing. By the way, I'm fully familiar with these numbers, and this stuff went by fast for me. So you guys are seeing this stuff. You're not immersed in it. It's probably difficult to follow this stuff because they're throwing up a lot of numbers. And even as they go up like this, it's hard to follow, and I've seen these things the whole time. The one last thing I want to say is, I think you guys are familiar with service areas, but it's how we divvy up the city into different areas that we can assess the impact fees for. Stormwater, there's really only one service area. Water, we could have had two. The island could have been a little higher because there's an additional transmission line to the island. And me personally, I think that impact fees can be used to say if you're going to build in a more expensive area, then you pay more. If the island is more expensive because it's more expensive to get a transmission line there, that's fine. The wastewater is the interesting one. We have six wastewater plants. And we initially, they showed us the service areas if there were six, one for each wastewater plant. And there was a significant difference. Um, downtown area was like $300 per ERU. The Allison area was like $2,000 per ERU. And I would think an impact fee could be a good way of saying, hey, it's cheaper to build here. We're going to have lower impact fees. It's more expensive to build here because we're at higher capacity. You'll pay more if you're there. By coming up with one service area, then we are kind of subsidizing the more expensive areas and overcharging the areas that already have plenty of capacity. And lastly, I don't think we came up with one service area because of the credits. The credits is such a small thing, and that's something we can solve in policies. We came up with one service area because of simplicity. Credits, we can do that with policies. We don't need to have one service area to do we don't to handle credits. I mean, I do think credit is an issue. I don't think developers should be stuck with the credit because they decided to go ahead and build something that the city was taking their time to. I think they should have more flexibility to spend that credit and not be stuck in the one service area. But once again, that's something that we can put forward in a policy and you guys can approve as council. Um, thank you, J.J. Hart. Uh, how many of you would have a hard time believing, I'm sorry? Sure, sir, go on. Roland, please, Councilman. How do I get, push this? How do I get, how do I get to you? Am I on? Yeah. Oh. Um, okay, so I, I agree with you. The, the, what I agree with you is, is that I don't think there's a differentiator between the home buyer the taxpayer because if you if you if you assess an impact fee then that fee it just as councilman Pusley indicated all it does is go into the cost of the rooftop so the developer is already incurring the cost of the infrastructure you know based on what they assess that's needed for that development so this is only the balance of which we're assessing as part of the master plan, which may or may not happen. So then we're assessing a fee. Now, right now, if we're building 1,000 homes and we're, the, the lot fee, we said, is roughly $1,000? Yes. So that's only a $1 million a year. I mean, even at the median here, that's only $7.5 million a year. So then I go back to if we're at $17 million at a deficit, you know, then either way, it's still not going to, there still has to be some change. Now, I support this, but at, at some point we have to say, are we going to incent the buyer today because we want to, we want to encourage development? Because I look at this and I'm optimistic because the regulatory cost, I can tell my son, hey, don't go buy a house in Austin, come to Corpus Christi. You know, I could tell my, you know, somebody 
Now, maybe Arlington's a little different, right? You know? But maybe that's what Arlington does in comparison to Dallas or Denton, is that are we trying to incur the development now and figure that with the ad valorem that we get, that, that all of a sudden we're going we're gonna to incur that? So, I, I mean, I support this. I think the idea of saying that we need to charge up front, we need to have the money in the bank just in case, I, I don't think it works that way when it comes to the public, the private se the public sector. And I appreciate all the work that you do, by the way. Here, by, by the way, how do you cover that deficit? Because 1,000 homes at $1,000 each is a $1 million. I mean, even at this component, even if you were at the medium, seven and a half million or $17 million deficit, how are you covering that? Well, and that's part of, uh, you know, the, the CIPs that were adopted by council are, are actually part of the CIPs of Ernie and, and, uh, and Drew's, you know, capital improvement plan. And these projects, uh, I, I know we did some examples like, oh, the developer will be over here doing that, but really, uh, we're going to, that operating department will get with the developers annually to say, hey, so what are you doing, right? Here's the master plan, and, you know, what's, you know, what's on deck? What's planned for the next fiscal year, right? So, uh, and that'll either be covered in the operating budget or in bond projects or something like that. So, um, uh, it, and I want to, and Mike Dye shared with me something that I've said all, all the time. The six, the one thousand six hundred and sixty-two dollars. Yes, it's not a lot, and, and of course, JJ and I had a, a million discussions about this. But it's incremental growth, right? We crawl, we walk, and then we run. Uh, and we'll be uh, engaging council every six months to we being SEAC, we saying, hey, uh, how's it working? Is the implementation that uh, process we thought is it working does it need to be tweaked all those kind of things including looking at the funding right uh, to see hey is growth happening and we need to get more money to stay out in front of it or do we have to lower it which you know could be the case at our less than one percent growth rate so there are a lot of variables uh, councilman that we need to look at and and work into our policy so that we can implement something that's that's functional for for our city and and how do we use this to leverage debt I mean, isn't that isn't that part of this purpose? It's a, it's a part of it. Do you want to? I mean, you can explain it to me later. Okay. That I'm I'm okay with it. So. I, um, yes, Mr. Miller. Commissioner. I just wanted to, and I'm actually kind of in support of one service area for everything, for the simple fact that, especially like, think about water. So if you've got a project that's collecting an impact fee in the London area, but you need to upsize something in a different part of town to service that you wouldn't be able to use those dollars outside that service area. Um, so I, if you did the pop the credits right, you could. Maybe, but trying to figure that out, and I, I'm what I'm saying is, what happened to the zero dollars for redevelopment component of this fee structure? I'm sorry, ask, ask the question again. I'm sorry. Well, I thought there was discussions about on redevelopment that there would be zero fees collected. Um, For redevelopment, that's part of the redevelopment policy. That will be part of the, the, the chairs. That's part of the policy we're working to, to we'll have to develop as well. Because I think that kind of addressed your example of, you Infill know. development, yes. Yeah, um, equity um, when it comes to that kind of deal. Because I think that's an important component of this because people that developed or platted lots, you know, within the city limits years ago and already paid in their lot and acreage fees or whatever for the infrastructure that they provided to provide service to that development, now they're getting double dipped whenever they come in. So, you know, the, the triggering, the important component of that is so long as there doesn't have to be something that needs to be upsized to accommodate this new development, because otherwise you're just collecting a fee for something that you're never going to spend the money on. And the I redevelopment policy would, would certainly address, uh, I'm sorry, the redevelopment policy would certainly address that so that they're not double dip. That very reason is why we wouldn't do it. For platted lots inside the city that hadn't developed right, so we wouldn't do that, so we hopefully could promote infield development. I mean, we did discuss redevelopment, and I don't, I think, we didn't take a vote, but I think the group is leading to no charge for redevelopment as long as it doesn't add additional burden to the system. If it's 
doing what it was there for before, even if they redo it, there should be no charge. Exactly right. And I want, as I said earlier when I started, uh, if there are any more questions, I know that uh, there's meeting for tea for council because they had a long Monday and even longer Tuesday. So uh, I just want to close with this. Uh, as you know, we're doing uh, community meetings. We've got one tomorrow night in D2 on, on May 20, uh, I think it's May 23rd, we've got D4 uh, on May 21st. Uh, I'm coming before council to simply set the public hearing date, request that we set the pu public hearing date for impact fees in uh, July. So that'll be coming, you'll, you'll see me again. Sorry about that, but uh, we'll make that request. And then we have other meetings, uh, community meetings, rounding this off, just explaining to the community, uh, those who come, and we had a great turnout in District 5, and, and Councilman Ananzas is not here, but it, it was, uh, I thought it was really great, and a lot of people came up and said, ooh, I, I support this. And I said, well, call your council member and make sure you know that, he knows that. So if there are no more questions, I thank you very much for your participation and for your time and effort, uh, and uh, have a wonderful afternoon. This workshop is hereby closed. Thank you. Good job.